now that we've laid the foundation of how the first life forms came about, right? Putting together those organic mon monomers and the organic polymers and encasing that in a protocell. Now we can start to talk about some of the evolutionary history of life on Earth, especially some of the early evolutionary history. How did some of these first prokaryotic organisms come about? And that's what we're going to tackle today. So those protocells that we first started talking about, right? Those membranes that just happen to encapsulate some of those organic polymers. We speed up a few million years and we have what we know of as the first cells. So what what is a cell, right? What makes up a cell? Well, all cells, regardless if they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic, all have the same basic four structures. All cells have a plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is that boundary that controls what goes into and what goes out of the cell and it protects the cell from the outside environment. It helps maintain an internal environment that is different from the external environment. All cells have a cytoplasm with ribosomes. So cytoplasm is basically the, the internal environment of the cell. It's usually an aqueous solution, mostly water-based. And then ribosomes, those are the machinery of the cell that's mostly made out of RNA that build proteins, right? So proteins are like the workers of the cell. They carry out all the important chemical processes and help the cell maintain life. But proteins are assembled by ribosomes, which are mostly made out of RNA. So the cytoplasm contains not only the goo, the liquid jelly stuff, but also the organelles that are in the cell. So we call the liquid cytosol. But altogether, the cytosol with the organelles, including ribosomes, is what we call the cytoplasm. So ribosomes are found in all cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and their main function is to build proteins. And then all cells have a region of DNA, genetic material. In prokaryotic organisms, their DNA is just floating in what we call a nucleoid region. In eukaryotic cells, it can be contained inside of a nucleus, but regardless, they all have DNA. So all life on our planet takes either one of two shapes. It's either a prokaryote or a eukaryote. So the root of these words, carry means kernel, and pro means first, and you means good or normal. It's sometimes translated in different ways. EU meaning good or normal. So pro means basically before kernel, before nucleus, and you means with nucleus in a sense. So nucleus is just a membrane that surrounds the DNA. Prokaryotic, prokaryotic organisms don't have a nucleus. They don't have a, their DNA protected inside of a second membrane. But that nucleus is important is because having your DNA protected inside of a second layer of that membrane, inside that nucleus, protects it from environmental factors like light, UV damage, helps protect it from UV damage. That nucleus also helps protect the DNA from byproducts of cellular metabolism that could potentially harm the DNA and cause mutations. So overall, prokaryotes are considered more simple than eukaryotes because they contain fewer organelles, their DNA is encased inside of a nucleus, and they generally have fewer internal structures than eukaryotic cells, where eukaryotic cells have organelles kind of like little compartments to carry out all the different cellular functions. Prokaryotes don't have all those little compartments. And while these drawings are not to scale, prokaryotes are much, much smaller than eukaryotic cells. And we'll see some, some of the difference in size in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells in lab this week. So like we talked about, we don't truly know when life evolved. And it's really hard to tell because we don't have a time machine and a lot of evidence from that time period hasn't survived for 4 billion years, right? Rocks are constantly being reformed and going back down in Earth's core and being melted and rearranged. So there's very few pieces of evidence that we can use to determine when life evolved. But we think the first prokaryotic organism lived about three and a half billion years ago and life may have existed up to 3.8 to maybe even just shy of 4 billion years ago, but we probably wouldn't have called it a prokaryotic organism. It would have been similar, but not quite a prokaryote. So we don't have fossils of the very first forms of life on Earth, and I don't think we'll ever have them just because rocks typically are not that old. But we do have fossils of an organism, which we see here, that we 
can date back to about 3.5 billion years ago. These are the oldest known fossils on our planet. And we recently have used a new form of chemical analysis to confirm that the structures that are found in this fossil are biological in their nature and not an artifact of other inorganic processes. So basically what we're looking at is microscopic fossils of prokaryotes in the stromatolite. And actually this fossil itself is made up of countless and countless biofilm mats of cyanobacteria. So if cyanobacteria are photosynthetic bacteria, they kind of look like this, like little beads on a chain, and they can carry out photosynthesis. And they form layers, mat-like layers, that over millions of years can form pillars that we call stromatolites. So we know that cyanobacteria are still around today, and they use the energy from the sun to create organic compounds through the, pro through the process of photosynthesis. We know that photosynthesis is a super complex process, and we have DNA evidence that it took millions of years to evolve. So we don't think that the early prokaryotes would have used photosynthesis. They were likely chemotrophs, but we can infer by the age of our oldest cyanobacteria fossils and by the time period that we think, how long we think photosynthesis would have evolved, that the earliest cells probably evolved around 3.8 to 4 billion years ago. So this is what they look like. These are in um, Lake Superior. These are some fossil stromatolites, kind of like what we were just looking at. Again, these are fossils of cyanobacteria that come from rocky pillars called these stromatolites. So stromatolites form when a layer of cyanobacteria, basically pond scum, <laughs> forms on the surface of a rock. Over time, tides are going in and out, and then those cyanobacteria get covered with a layer of sediment. And then we get more cyanobacteria that colonize that sediment, and then we get another layer of sediment. So that's how these form. And then when we, can, we cut into this rock, we can see layers like we saw in that fossil before. So we still have living stromatolites in Australia today. They, go, they grow very, very, very slowly. It takes about 100 years for these stromatolites to add about 5 centimeters. So that's way slower than a coral reef. That's much slower than even some of the slowest growing trees on our planet. So these are really, really old. But why are we spending so much time talking about photosynthetic bacteria? Why these cyanobacteria? Why are they so important? So cyanobacteria, those bacteria that make up stromatolites, they play two very important roles in the evolution of life as we know it. First, we think that they were the first organisms to go through the process of photosynthesis, which is huge. Because in photosynthesis, organisms can make their own food. They can use the solar energy and inorganic sources of carbon to build their own organic molecules. And then they can use those organic molecules that they create to make ATP. So that's a huge advantage, being able to make your own food if you just have sunlight and some inorganic carbon, usually carbon dioxide. This means that they can produce their own food instead of having to seek out food by eating other organisms, and that the photosynthesis increases the amount of organic compounds around, meaning that they're making that those organic compounds available to other organisms. Not necessarily by their choice, right? They don't usually choose to be eaten, but cyanobacteria could have been eaten by other prokaryotes to get a source of organic compounds. The other really important reason that cyanobacteria and stromatolites are so important is because they literally changed the atmosphere of the Earth. For most of Earth's early history, the oxygen levels in our atmosphere were really low. And oxygen, like we've talked about, is really important for the process of cellular respiration of building ATP in an aerobic environment. So here on this graph we see the oxygen levels relatively low. Life as we know it today could not exist with this with this little amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. But when cyanobacteria started photosynthesizing, they produce oxygen gas as a byproduct, just like plants do today. We Most of our oxygen in our, in our atmosphere comes from plants or bacteria or protists going through the process of photosynthesis. So most, for a while, most of this oxygen, oxygen remained dissolved in the waters of the ocean, um, and so it didn't enter the atmosphere right away, 
some of it started to enter the atmosphere and we think it would have started to react with iron to form iron oxides. But then, once most of the iron was oxidized and the oceans reached their the maximum amount of oxygen they could hold, that oxygen gas basically just exploded in the atmosphere. Not literally exploded, it wasn't a fireball, but it caused a huge uptick in the oxygen levels of the atmosphere. So we call this time in, our, in Earth's history the oxygen revolution. This oxygen revolution occurred from about 2.7 to 2.3 billion years ago when the amount of oxygen and gas in the atmosphere rose by an incredibly fast amount. So it would have taken a lot of cyanobacteria to produce this much oxygen. This much oxygen, this huge change in Earth's atmosphere over a relatively short period of time would have had a huge impact on life on our planet. This actually triggered a mass extinction event because a lot of life around at the time was anaerobic. It could not function properly in an oxygen rich environment because oxygen reacts with chemical bonds, it can inhibit enzymes, it can damage DNA and cells. So a lot of organisms didn't have the capability to deal with that much oxygen. Some species survived this mass extinction and went along to colonize life as we know it today, right? But this oxygen rich atmosphere is what laid the foundation for the process of aerobic cellular respiration to evolve. And aerobic cellular respiration is what a lot of eukaryotes use today to extract large amounts of energy, large amounts of ATP from the food that we consume. One of the major evolutionary steps that occurred after the oxygen revolution was the evolution of eukaryotic organisms. Eukaryotic organisms, organisms with a nucleus and organelles to carry out their life's processes, we think evolved kind of an, as a response to that oxygen revolution. So this image here is a fossil of one of the early eukaryotic organisms and some scientists believe that this organism would have been around about 1.8 billion years ago. And the evolution of eukaryotic life is one of the most fascinating and well-supported stories in science. But it wouldn't have been possible without those prokaryotic ancestors.